So my name is Maren Benowitz. It's my pleasure to introduce the next speaker to you, which is uh, Angela Scherleck. Angela is an assistant professor at the University of Toronto Institute for Aerospace Studies, where she heads the Dynamic Systems Lab. She is also an associate director of the Center for Aero Robotics Research and Education. Angela holds a Canada Research Chair in Machine Learning for Robotics and Control, and is also a PI of the Canadian Robotics Network, and also a faculty affiliate of the Canadian Vector Institute for AI. She holds two master degrees, one from the University of Stuttgart in Germany in engineering cybernetics, and one in engineering science and mechanics from Georgia Tech. So Angela received her PhD from ETH Zurich in 2013, and got two prestigious awards for her thesis. Uh, her research lies uh, in the interface of robotics controls and machine learning, and she has been working with aerial vehicles already for a long time, and has also recently applied her uh, research, her algorithms to self-driving vehicles with great success, I must say. So her team won the uh, 2018 North American Auto Drive Challenge. So um, Angela has already won several early career awards, we are very impressed by your career so far, and we are looking forward to your presentation with the title Machine Learning in the Closed Loop Safety and Performance Guarantees for Robot Learning. Okay, welcome everybody. Um, I'm very honored to be able to give this early career spotlight today. I hope you can hear me okay. Um, in this talk, I want to show you the algorithms that we have been developing that um, enable robots to learn while guaranteeing safety and performance during the learning process. This work is, of course, due to an amazing team of students and collaborators. And if you come to our lab, you don't only see those students, but you also see a lot of moving robots. So this gives a bit of the context for our work. We aim to um, develop algorithms that enable teams of robots to fly with high performance and in coordinated ways. And we have applications in mind such as inspection and monitoring. And so what you see here is vehicles flying in a mock-up nuclear facility in Toronto. We also fly outdoors with vision in the loop as a backup for GPS, and here we have winds up to 25 kilometers per hour. We have also applications in mining in Canada, and currently do outdoor experiments with this off-road vehicle, as well as we drive on the road, and we just won the second year of the General Motors self-driving car competition. One of the latest additions is this mobile manipulator um, where we work on uh, mobile manipulation for manufacturing. So this gives you a sense of the context of um, our work. And really it is um, the vision that we have for robotics where we see robots na hopefully navigate soon our skies and our roads help us in their da our daily tasks, as well as possibly in the future collaborate with us in the workplace. What all these applications have in common is that the robots have to operate in a wide range of different conditions. So there's large prior uncertainties about how they behave and about the environment itself. These robots have to actively make decisions and we expect them to be safe and um, exhibit high performance. So a traditional approach to do this task in robotics is control. There we develop a system model, usually derived from first principle physics. We use system identification and data from the real system to identify parameters of those models, for example, the inertia values, and then we use that identified model to design a controller. And the controller works and this approach works really well in controlled environments where the models are a good approximation of the real world. We also um, have tools to quantify robustness towards model errors um, and guarantee safety um, despite model errors. And there are explicit ways to incorporate safety constraints. 
for example, um, that a flying vehicle stays within that room and doesn't fly into the wall. So control theory is really good at models, studying feedback, guaranteeing safety, and analyzing the worst case. But worst case for applications that you see here in the middle is often not the right thing because of the variety of conditions they can encounter. If we optimize for the worst case, these vehicles will probably likely not even move. So we need a way to enable these systems to learn and adapt. And this is not traditionally a concept that is part of control theory. So in control theory, the performance of the system is limited by our understanding of the system. On the other hand, there are reinforcement learning approaches that um, usually in the standard way get rid of the model, directly use data samples and use that data to optimize the control. And a setup like this um, looks usually like this. So we have a learner that tries different actions and then observes how the robot behaves and how much, um, how much closer it gets to achieving the task, which is usually encoded in the reward. And so this approach collects relevant data for a given task, and we get values for this from this reward. And the performance it tries to optimize is typically in expectations. So it tries to optimize the expected performance. Reinforcement learning has had a lot of success recently in things like games, um, playing Go against the best player human players, um, developing policies to enable virtual character characters to walk, or also um, enabling manipulation tasks in lab environments. But what this all, ha all these examples have in common is that it's a controlled environment that is not safety critical. So if we look at the comparison, machine learning is really good at collecting data, learning from data, um, trading off exploration and exploitation, and optimizing for the average case. It, however, doesn't guarantee safety, and is usually not very sample efficient because no prior information is incorporated in these algorithms. So really, safety and um, worst case um, guarantees are not present, so here the safety is limited by our lack of the system understanding that because we don't incorporate any prior information usually in a standard approach. So our idea is to combine these both approaches, use models and data to achieve, um, sys enable systems to learn by guaranteeing safety. In this talk, I want to highlight some of the work that we have been doing over the last years, going from single robot, single task learning in unknown but static conditions to multi-robot, multi-task learning in changing conditions. So let's start with the left side. So for a single robot learning a single task, and a good example to kind of visualize is we want a flying vo vehicle to do a slalom at very high speeds. A traditional approach in control looks like this. We have a controller that at least keeps the vehicle s in the air, so it stabilizes this unstable system. And usually what we provide as a reference to the baseline controller is the trajectory that we want the robot to do. So R is equal to the desired output that we want to see. If we do this for our robot, here you see the trajectory in a vertical plane. So blue is the desired trajectory, so the input to the system, and then we perform this task a couple of times, and every time we get one of these colored lines, but we see a large repetitive error, and if I do the task over and over again, the robot doesn't use the previous information to somehow improve. So that's kind of standard control. So now, in our approach, we try to understand the model error that is clearly pres present here. We see large repetitive errors. We want to safely acquire data and learn the this particular task, and then also analyze the performance and uh, safety. So the good thing is, because we have this underlying controller closed, there is a fixed but unknown mapping from a sequence of inputs, the R, to a sequence of outputs, Y. And you see that here again, right? So there is some kind of repetitive behavior. 
but we don't know this mapping. So a way to do to um, approach this problem is you can imagine why not gradually changing R such that eventually we see at the output what we'd like to see. And so you can actually do that in a more formal way. You start in the first iterations by just giving Y desired as, as I showed you before. And then we use a course model that gives us a relationship between the tracking error that we saw in the last trial and how we should change our reference signal. And this comes from this M hat is um, a rough model that just tells us in which direction to correct the reference signal to get better over time. If we do such an approach, we can guarantee input-output stability because as long as R is bounded, we know that Y is bounded and so the vehicle doesn't fall out of the sky. And we also can show that the tracking error monotonically converges to low values or even zero. So let's see this um, in a video. So here the vehicle learns. This was the first iteration. And then it gradually updates the reference input that it sends to the vehicle to eventually do the task. And you see, we just need three trials to learn this correction to the input to actually do the task. And this is another task, but we need to relearn that from scratch. So this, what you see here is the learned result. We can do other tasks as well, like triple flips. So here you, the vehicle should come back to where it started after having done three rotations around its own axis. And so after several iterations, it can actually do that. So this has enabled uh, learning a single task by changing the reference signal directly. But every new task has to be relearned. So a key ingredient to go from learning a single task to learning multi task, um, multiple tasks or leveraging knowledge from one task for another is learning a model. And this is sometimes also called one-shot learning because ideally you can leverage the knowledge from one task to do another task perfectly right from the beginning. And so how to do that is very similar. We assume again we have this underlying baseline controller and then we have the same fixed unknown um, underlying system. I write it in a slightly different way for future derivations, but this assumption is exactly the same as before. We assume there is a, an underlying um, representation that explains what's happening in this gray box. And then we can, of course, run the system many, many times because we have this underlying controller. There's no harm in collecting pairs of inputs and outputs. And if we look at the representation here, we can actually, even so we don't know the model, if we assume the representation as I have written it here is correct, then we can actually derive uh, the, the representation of R that would achieve perfect tracking. And that is the representation. So it would be a function of the state of the system and the desired um, output R steps in the future. And R is the system delay. So if the system is R steps delayed um, or has R steps of internal delay, you need to give the future trajectory to the system. So by kind of analyzing um, the dynamics and um, obtaining this relationship, it greatly helps us to come up with a structure that actually very efficiently learns um, a system inverse, a model that we can reuse for other tasks. And so we just know these are the necessary inputs and then we place this block that we had before again in front of a system. You, never, you don't even have to know exactly what is in this gray box. And you can learn this system inverse. Here we use a deep neural networks to learn it, but you could use another nonlinear regression technique. The only thing that has changed is we have some feedback here of the state. We can still analyze the input-output stability and can, for example, show that even if the inverse of this gray box, which is basically what the green box tries to approximate, is unstable, 
we still learn a stable, the closest stable um, approximation of the inverse, so we never have problems with instability. There are no formal guarantees on performance if you use deep neural networks because it's really hard to analyze if the deep neural network has actually learned enough already. So what we do in practice is we learn this plot from periodic motions and then test it on arbitrary hand-drawn trajectories. Whenever people come to the lab, they are able to draw on a tablet and we try it. And so here are some of the results. So based on the initially learned inverse model, um, we achieve a 62% improvement on any of these arbitrary um, hand-drawn trajectories. So this shows kind of a, su a summary. So you people draw. And then these trajectory is hard to follow with a standard controller. So here you see our baseline controller. And then after learning, we get significantly better tracking. And so if you come to the lab, it would look like this. You could draw something on your tablet or your device. And then we test it with a pre-trained network, so we don't particularly learn anything about the hand-drawn trajectory that you have been drawn. So mo learning models is a great, great way to transfer knowledge from one task to another. And here you saw one shot learning, so we use the model trained on a set of tasks and then it did quite well on a new task it has never seen before. However, all the approaches that I've shown you so far really have an explicit training phase. So the next step is really how can we achieve continuous improvement? Ideally, the robot moves in the real world and every data point we collect is used to improve um, the model, improve the pe performance of the robot. And for this approach, we actually now place the learning model directly in the controller. So I it's a change. Um, and the reason is that controllers can much better handle um, the fact that we continuously update the model. So here we have a model-based controller that relies on a learning model. And that learning model is modeling just the robot. So it's a slightly different um, setup. Why is that even important? Um, if we use a wrong model in a controller, as for example here in this video, um, you see the robot and you see what it predicts, and it tries to follow this dotted line um, and go through the pylons. But we didn't model the dynamics of the robot, and you know, with the particularly set up uh, parkour that we did here, it would collide with these um, pylons because of modeling errors. So the, the approach that we use is the following. We assume that the robot can be modeled with an a priori model. In the example that I showed you, this could be a kinematics model. And then we have an additive component that we don't know. This can come from the interaction of the wheels with the ground and so on. And so we try to learn that. Um, but now I showed you it can be really problematic if you have a wrong model in the controller. So what we do is we model this as a stochastic um, a um, process, like a Gaussian process. So what, what that means is initially we assume we know nothing or almost nothing about this unknown function. We just assume it lies anywhere in this blue shaded area. And then we model it with a Gaussian process, meaning that whenever we get a new data point, we learn something about this underlying function. And the, um, the uncertainty interval um, that represents our belief over the set of functions goes down in the area where I collected a data point, but also in neighboring areas. And so as I collect more data points, I get more certain. And um, I have a 
kind of a probabilistic way of describing my belief of what the unknown function is. And this probabilistic way I can nicely incorporate in concepts from control theory called robust control. Robust control is able to design controllers for a set of models. So if I don't know exactly what my model is, robust control can design me a controller that works for all of them. And so we combine both this stochastic model that describes our current belief of what the robot dynamics is with robust control. And if we do that, then we can show that the tracking error can be made arbitrarily small in some cases and constrain satisfaction with high probability. So let's look at the car example again. Um, so for the car example, we incorporate this um, stochastic model into a model predictive control. And so here is what intuitively happens. So if the robot is here at the current moment and sh should follow this path, then over the next 10 seconds, I can predict what the robot does based on the input sequence I choose. And because it's a stochastic model, I cannot perfectly say where the robot ends up. Um, and as a result, it could end up anywhere in this orange en envelope and may violate those path constraints. So what then the model predictive controller would automatically do is it would reduce the velocity over the next time horizon such that I can guarantee that I stay within the path bounds with high probability. And then as I learn more about the un unknown component G, my uncertainty goes down and I can try faster. And so here you see that in, in the video. So on the left is when the robot tries to try this off-road path for the first time. You see large uncertainty envelopes and slower velocities. And then on the right, it's when it has driven the path for the th um, three times. And you see it drives significantly faster. It drove so, f so fast that we had to run and um, it was at speeds that we had never tried before. So this is a nice way to incorporate every data point you have in real time. So we get data points at around 10 hertz and incorporate that directly in the Gaussian process and use it for control. So the final kind of um, transition is how do we go from single robot to multi-robot or from static conditions to changing conditions? And from my perspective, these two things are really the same because if I change, I uh, use learned knowledge from one robot and I want to apply it to a different robot, the dynamics change. The underlying robot may be slightly different. And that's the same if for some reason I have changing conditions, for example, changing weather conditions for a self-driving car. Um, so really what happens is the underlying dynamics change over time. And so the, re the modeling error that we try to learn now is a function of time. So it may change at any time. And so this is a, work we, uh, or a topic that we have been working on for the last um, few months and continue to work on. Um, so one approach that we have come up with that's very powerful is um, to quickly adapt and long-term learn. And that's the same as what you would expect a human to do. If something suddenly changes, um, the best thing you can do is very quickly adapt. But if there are changes that happen over and over again, you may want to leverage long-term knowledge. For example, if you drive with your car and suddenly it starts raining, the best thing is to adapt. But you know, if, if you encounter a year later again that it's snowing again, you know um, you have driven on snow before last winter, and so you may want to reuse that. And so the architecture that we have is now we have this um, adaptive controller un in the underlying loop that very, very quickly adapts and makes the baseline system perform like a linear system. And then we have this outer um, component that just compensates for um, the lin linear map that the adaptive controller provides and further improves performance. And so here we have similar performance guarantees again. 
But the amazing thing is, since the adaptive controller tries to make the dashed box linear, it's really easy for the outer part now to learn this linear map. And this outer part really looks the same as the deep neural network approach, but this time it's real, really just a linear map. So let me just show you some results for that. So we have a source system, a quadrotor that learns a source task, and now we transfer this to a different system doing a different task. And so the particular task that we are looking at right now are just simple tra different trajectories in the state space. And so the uh, results that I show you is we, for example, use one task um, that we learn on the source system, and they tr then we test how we can use that knowledge to do any of the other tasks on the target system. And so we do all these combinations, and so here are the results. So on the y-axis is arrow, on the right is the different trajectories that we test. So if, um, if the ro target robot is the doing the task just without any learning, it's th these um, um, white dots, that's the arrow that we usually see for the different six tra trajectories. Then we can also look at if this robot learns this trajectory iteratively, how well does it get? So that's kind of the best we think we can achieve with this robot for this particular task. Um, and then we check what happens if we transfer knowledge. And so if we transfer knowledge from the source robot to the target robot, um, we get these box plots depending, they represent the six different ways we can transfer information. And um, you see we get really close to um, what the robot would get in the ideal case. So on average, we get 74% error reduction with transfer learning. And we just use one single trajectory learned on one robot to do um, something else on another robot. So in summary, so some of the key ingredients, no matter how you set up your system, I believe, is that you learn a model that probabilistic formulations help you to understand what you know and what you don't know and fast adaptation and long-term learning I think is a really interesting direction to further expand what robots can learn. So ultimately our goal was to achieve performance and safety for robots in uncertain situations and we s claim that robots must learn and adapt to get better and do that in a safe manner um, and in a data efficient manner. So what I showed you, hopefully, is that we often could improve performance by using machine learning techniques, and machine learning is really the science of data and infer inference, but that we can look at safety and data efficiency by leveraging s knowledge that we learn from control theory, which is really the science of feedback and automation. So the um, control theory for a long time has studied properties such as stability, performance, and robustness of closed-loop systems. And ultimately, every robot is a closed-loop system, and we need both machine learning and control to analyze and design um, effective decision strategies. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Angela, for the interesting presentation and impressive videos. Mm -hmm. So we have some time for questions. Up there. Thank you very much for this very inspiring talk. Really, I'm really impressed by your work and uh, the clarity also of the presentation. Um, so uh, just a small remark, the, the control theory has come up with robust control, as you said, stability analysis, but also adaptive control. So uh, could you give us a word of why you do learning instead of adaptive control, mm -hmm. for instance? So adaptive control, usually the formulation is um, you learn a set of, it's a, a much more parameter, uh, parameterized way to learn. So in adaptive control, you have usually an unknown vector of um, parameters that you quickly adapt. And that works really well um, in some cases. For example, you, you saw we use it as an underlying control, uh, underlying scheme to very quickly correct. So it's a very fast way to adapt. But um, it, it still lacks some of the properties that we see that we can 
improve from iteration to iteration in an arc causal way. So for example, for um, flying a slalom or if you drive on a racetrack, you do make decisions now that affect your future and get better on the track. This is not something that standard uh, um, adaptive controllers would kind of incorporate. Further questions? Ah, over there. Yeah. Hi. Um, one question about the uh, additive modeling, where you have a model plus mm -hmm. a data-driven uh, component. Uh, so when the GP starts and, and it's added to the model, it, its uncertainty might not be calibrated because in principle, you might not have run the hyperparameter optimization, in which case the safety guarantees based on, um, based on uncertainty might not be valid. So, so, so how do you go about the process of calibrating the uncertainty at the same time ensuring that safety is uh, yeah. Uh, valid? Yeah, that's a very valid question. So um, basically, these hyper yeah, often you learn the hyperparameters for GP from initial data. That kind of um, is against our whole purpose that we say the robot needs, to we don't have the chance of training a priori. So one way to do deal with that is what robust control theory people do all the time. They derive these kind of uncertainty bounds from prior knowledge. Um, data sheets, um, an understanding of the system. The other way is you can just make them extremely conservative. So you choose your uncertainty bounds very large, your length scales, um, uh, such that you would generally need a lot of data to learn and you allow any uh, very arbitrary and fast changing um, underlying trajectories. Basically, the, um, yeah, you can, there is a trade-off between, even in the GP, in, in terms of incorporating prior knowledge and the amount of data you need. So if you incorporate a lot of prior knowledge, for example, in terms of the hyperparameters, that might help you to um, require less data. But if you know nothing, you can you know, incorporate very little information and allow a large class of um, functions to be um, possibilities, and then you need a lot of data. So there is a trade-off still. Right. Okay, then let's thank the speaker again. Okay.